Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at the History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and the History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join the History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with the History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, the History Guy talks about two ancient societies, the still mysterious Itza Maya, who built Chichen Itza, and the story of the forgotten trading empire of Aksum, located in modern-day Eritrea and Ethiopia. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. While Europe was in the Middle Ages, across the world on the Yucatan Peninsula, the Mayan civilization was in its prime. While most of the pre-contact Mayan history was destroyed by the Spanish invaders, there are a few stories that we can tease out of the remaining texts, and one of those is the rise of a particular group of Maya called the Itza and their long and influential history in the area. They ruled from their mighty city of Chichen Itza, which is today one of the most spectacular archaeological sites in the Yucatan and they were the last of the Maya to capitulate to the Spanish invaders, 150 years after the rest of the Maya civilization had collapsed. The rise, the magnificent civilization, and the eventual fall of the Itza is uh, an epic tale, the Beowulf or Gilgamesh of Mesoamerica. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The Mayan civilization, unlike the nearby Aztec or Incan civilizations, was itself never an empire or ruled by a single leader. Instead, the Maya were bound culturally and linguistically, but were made up of numerous ethnic groups and tribes, and were, in general, ruled by more powerful city-states or local lords. The political patchwork nature of the Mayan civilization played a large part in their history. One of these groups, called lineages, houses, or tribes, was the Itza. It isn't known for sure when or where the Itza originated, but it seems that they arrived in the Yucatan at the end of the Maya Classic period around 900 AD. They may have come from the southern Mayan highlands, modern-day Guatemala and Honduras, migrating during the massive collapse that marked the end of the Classic Mayan period. In all the narrative sources we have for the Maya, the Itza seemed to be specifically a people apart. They were feared and hated by other Mayan groups and called those who speak our language brokenly. They seem to have had unique customs and were also called rogues and disrespectful of their elders. Spanish friar André de Avendano says that they beheaded men over 50 so that they shall not learn to be wizards and to kill. When they arrived in the Yucatan, they settled at a site of a smallish town called Ukbalam. The name has not been positively deciphered, but possible translations include seven great rulers, seven great houses, and seven bushy places. Shortly after they set up control of the city, it became known as Chichen Itza, a name meaning at the mouth of the well of the Itza, probably referring to the great water-filled sinkhole known as the sacred Senate. The lowlands of the Yucatan have no rivers or lakes. Instead, they have sinkholes that offer access to one of the most complex systems of underground caves and rivers in the world. Under the hegemony of the Itza tribe, Chichen Itza became the most important center of the Mayan lowlands. The former centers of Kaba and Yashua were on the decline, and the Itza were able to fill the gap. At its height, Chichen Itza held sway almost over the entire Yucatan Peninsula. The city controlled a port on the north coast called the Isla Cerritos, and through it, the Itzas became the important players in trade up and down the coast. Especially valuable in trade was their control of the natural salt resources, and they traded for jade, gold, pottery, and obsidian. This was the height of Chichen Itza's dominance, a city of possibly as many as 50,000 people. It was during this time that the greatest construction took place at the site. Possibly the most famous structure of the city stands over the carefully flattened ground of the city and dominates the ruins, the Temple of Kukulkan. The Mayan word for the snake serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. 
Also known as El Castillo, or the castle, the large step pyramid is a marvel of architecture. Designed as a major ceremonial center, it is perfectly positioned to provide natural amplification for speakers standing atop it. The pyramid was built to be a physical representation of the Mayan calendar. Each side of the pyramid has 91 steps, with the last one leading into the temple at the top, representing each of the 365 days in a year. The nine levels, bisected by stairways on each side, represent the 18 months of the Mayan calendar. Perhaps most impressively, on the equinoxes each year, the light hits the pyramid in a way that creates the winding image of a snake on the stairway, which slowly descends with the sun to represent Kuku Khan's descent from the sky to the underworld. Signs of Chichen Itza's wealth are even now present in the ruins of the site. The temple of Kuku Khan lies atop a second temple, and within the tower's temple's main chamber lies a jaguar throne, studded with valuable jade and shells. At its peak, the temples were painted with brilliant colors, very little of which remains today. Chichen Itza is also home to the largest ball court in Central America. The ball game played by Mesoamerican cultures was unique among ancient sports in that it was played by many different cultures across a vast space. Over 1,300 ball courts have been found, stretching across time from 1400 BC to contact with the Europeans. The ball court at Chichen Itza dwarfs any other yet discovered, 550 by 230 feet. Its walls are decorated with detailed depictions of players. The sheer size of the field was a statement of the oversized wealth and power of the city in the post-classic period. Another symbol of the Itza's wealth at their height is the enormous Temple of the Warriors, and beside it, the Thousand Columns. Some of the columns in front of the Warrior Temple are carefully decorated with depictions of individuals, and no two of them are the same. These may have represented trophies of captured foes, as well as paintings of particularly famous or renowned soldiers of the city. Two more, much smaller ball courts stand within the complex. Just north of the city lies the Great Sacred Cenote, an important and sacred ceremonial site where the Maya threw offerings, including human sacrifices, to their deities. Archaeologists dread the Cenote in the 1920s and found that the people sacrificed here seemed to have come from all over the Mesoamerican region. Sometime during their reign, the Itzes became associated with the Toltecs. The arrival of the Toltecs traditionally separates Old Chitsen, a complex of smaller temples and edifices in the Mayan Puic style, and New Chitsen, the site of the ball court, El Castillo, and the Temple of the Warriors, which have Toltec styles. The Toltecs have a complex place within Mesoamerican archaeology. They have traditionally been remembered as a warlike people who ruled an empire from the city of Tula, and their king was called Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan, after the Mesoamerican god. Much of the history of the Toltecs we have comes specifically from Aztec sources, who revered the Toltecs as an ideal society. Sometime during the reign of the Itzas, the Toltecs became involved with Chichen Itza, which is evident in the Toltec style of the later and larger monuments. Early literature theorized the city had been conquered by the Toltecs, but modern studies has brought this idea into question. Despite the Toltec influence on the architecture, archaeologists emphasize that Chichen Itza is neither uniquely Mayan nor uniquely Toltec, but is an active blend of ideas from the central Mexican area and traditional Mayan concepts. The, the Mayan relationship with the Toltecs is still a matter of interpretation. And in fact, some scholars suggest that the Aztec description of the Toltecs is so tangled in myth that the Toltecs might not really have existed as described at all. Sometime during their time in the Yucatan, the Itza are said to have abandoned Chichen Itza to found a city of Shakanpudum. This foray into the wilderness of the Yucatan may have lasted over 200 years, although its veracity is uncertain. They were eventually chased out of Shakanpudum, apparently by another group of Itza, according to the chronicles. After that, they lived for 40 years under the trees in ash and poverty. They eventually returned to Chichen Itza in the 10th century. While the Maya had many written histories, during the Spanish conquest much of what was left behind was systematically and deliberately destroyed. Only a few late Maya texts survive in which the coalescing indigenous and Spanish traditions combine to present a muddled memory of Mayan history. One of these is the Chilam Balam, the name representing an author, Chilam meaning priest and Balam meaning jaguar. Among the miscellaneous Mayan and Spanish parts of the text, it also relates the story of the decline and fall of Chichen Itza. Sometime around the turn of the millennium, the Mayan ruler, Amakat Tutul Xiu, founded what historians call the League of Mayapan, an alliance between Chichen Itza, Uxmal, and Mayapan. Diego de Landa, a Spanish bishop involved in the destruction of much of the Maya codices, wrote that Mayapan was founded by valorous captains of the Itza, 
while Ushmal was formed by another Mayan tribe, the Shu. Of the three cities, Chichen Itza was the largest, most important. The League of Mayapan effectively ruled the entire peninsula, but was beset by internal and external conflict. What little we know about Chichen Itza's fall is entwined with oral history and myth, and comes from a handful of the Chalambalam books, especially the one found at the city of Mani. The narratives are fragmentary and have been described as incoherent, but parts of the story can be understood. It gives the date that the head chief of the Chichen Itza was driven out because of the treachery of Hunak Sail, and the city was depopulated. What precisely this treachery was is a mystery. Involved was definitely the city of Ushmal, Chok Sib Chok, a possibly mythical king of Chichen Itza, and Hunak Sail, leader of the city of Mayapan. Hunak Sail's origin is unknown, but one story we have from his life is that he survived being thrown into the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza. Many people were thrown into the cenote as part of ritual sacrifices, but there was a custom that if someone survived, they would be pulled or would climb from the cenote to give a prophecy about the upcoming year. Hunak Sale, possibly as a prisoner, was thrown into the cenote, and the following day gave a prophecy. Amash Kuk, leader of the Chichen Itza, then helped Tere Sale to become leader of Mayapan. The events leading up to Hunak Sale's treachery are even foggier. In a tale reminiscent of the Greek legend of Troy, a prince of Chichen Itza stole another's wife, precipitating the war. A telling of this story survived the conquest. San Nyat, or White Flower, was a princess meant to be married to Al Uli El, a prince of Ushmal. But the princess had fallen in love with Khan Eik, or Black Serpent, a prince of Chichen Itza, who on her wedding day brought his warriors to the festivities and stole her away. To avenge, A Uli El and Hunak Sale raised a band of warriors from central Mexico. Seven men is named in the Chilam Balam, and with them sought to destroy Chichen Itza. But when Hunak Sale arrived, the Itza had already fled ahead of him. It isn't clear if there was a fight or if the city was sacked. There is some evidence that the city was sacked near this time, but some scholars have suggested Chichen Itza had ceased to be an important center decades before Mayapan rose to prominence. The Itza were said to have gone into the heart of the forest of Tashu Lukmul, near Lake Patain. The Itza were still at Lake Patain 400 years later, when they told Spanish priests they had come from Chichen Itza. Mayapan then took over undisputed control of the peninsula and remained in power for another 250 years, until further infighting brought down the League of Mayapan entirely in the mid-1400s. Chichen Itza remained an important ceremonial and pilgrimage site even after the conquest. Though they did not call themselves Itza, likely Itza descendants helped to fight tenaciously against the Spanish before the Yucatan was subdued in the 1540s. Mayapan itself, sometimes called the last great city of the Maya, was built to mimic the great city. It too has a temple of Kukulkan, similar to El Castillo, though much smaller. At its height, it may have been a city of 12,000 people. In Patain, where the ethnically Itza Maya live today, the Itza founded a city called Noje Patan, meaning Great Island, unlike Patain. The Spanish called it Tayasal, a corruption of Tai Itza, meaning Place of the Itza, and today it is known as Flores, Guatemala. While they remained busy building an empire of 230,000 square kilometers inside under four different kingdoms subordinate to the Itza, which was at its height when Cortes landed in 1519. After the Battle of Sintla, shortly after the landing, the Itza sent Cortes several princesses as an offering of peace, and one of these princesses, Malin Tsin, would play a role in the fall of the Aztec Empire. The Itza were an embattled empire during the conquest as the Spanish encroached on the kingdoms. Cortes executed the last Aztec king while he was traveling through Itza territory in 1523, and he celebrated Mass at Noche Patin with Khan Ek that December. After the fall of most of the Mayan world in the 1540s, the Itza remained independent and steadfastly refused to submit to Spanish rule or to convert to Catholicism. The heavily forested and remote nature of the Patan area contributed to the Itza's continued independence as the rest of pre-colonial Mesoamerica fell one after the other to Spanish rule. They defeated the Spanish armies and to conquer them in 1622 by ambush. And as late as 1696, Spanish priests preached peacefully to the last Itza king at Noje Patan. But in 1697, a Spanish army under Martin de Ursa, governor of the Yucatan, came to the city and officially forced the Itza to submit to Spanish rule. There was a short fight, but the use of an ore-powered attack boat caused heavy casualties and forced the Itza to surrender. They were one of the last indigenous cities to be conquered, 
150 years after the Spanish conquered the Yucatan. The story of the Itza is one of greatness, of decline, of tenacity. In the ever-changing political landscape of Mayan culture, they managed to cling to an extraordinary amount of power for more than a thousand years. And while much of their history has been lost or destroyed or mythicized, what remains is the story of a determined and crafty people who have indelibly left their mark upon this earth. Their famous pyramid at Chichen Itza, connected with the perhaps now infamous Mayan calendar, has become a famous icon of their people. Today only a few thousand ethnic Itza survive, and only a few of those still speak the language, a version of Maya, perhaps as few as a dozen still speak it fluently. Their great city of Chichen Itza had already been abandoned by the time the Spanish arrived in the Americas, and by 1588 it was being used as a cattle ranch. American explorer John Lloyd Stevens published a book with illustrations of the city in 1843, which would lead more explorers and later photographs of the overgrown ruins. In the long time since, much of the site has been excavated. The Great Cenote has been dragged for Mayan artifacts, and parts of the site have been restored. It is now one of the most popular archaeological sites to visit in Mexico. It received 2.5 million visitors in 2017. In 2007, Chichen Itza was voted one of the new wonders of the world. The Itza and their once magnificent civilization are literally etched in the stone there and in the minds of the millions of people who now come to see the city that they left behind. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind the scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. Okay, so I, I really think that the the story of the Itza Maya is is quite incredible, even if we only know you know we only know pieces of it, and I think there's some significant tragedy in all of the records that were destroyed uh, by the Spanish. But in some ways, uh, the Itza story actually mirrors many ancient histories from around the world, doesn't it? Yes, I mean in in so many ways, uh, it, it mirrors them in that they were great civilizations. About we don't know much about them. Uh, it mirrors that they they built great things, and then their records were lost. Uh, and it, it mirrors, uh, interestingly, that I mean, if you change some of the names, this could easily be a European civilization, and uh, you could uh, easily tie. I mean, we probably know relatively more about the Greeks, uh, but. Uh, so much of what you describe in the story of the Itza sounds very much like the Trojan Wars. Uh, and and so, yeah, it is. It is a compelling. And that's one of the reasons it's so interesting is that it's, it's a compelling story, really, of humanity. And it shows us one of the things that really shows us is that history is pretty common wherever you go. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, people are fighting over resources. People are building empires. Those empires are rising and falling. There's there's war, there's treachery, but there's also there's also love and uh, science. And, and, you know, it's it's just interesting. This was a, this was a, a vibrant people that I think that if we were to know them and could speak their language, we would find are not all that different than us. And uh, that's really what's you know, so exciting about the story. And it's amazing to see what they left behind that we don't understand. It makes you think, you know, if we disappeared today, uh, you know, what would people make of our ruins? You know, obviously much, much larger, but I mean, you know, the same. At some point, the, the forests are going to take over our ruins and they're going to come and they're going to find these things. And they're going to say, you know, who were these people and what does it mean? And in the same way that we're trying to figure that out about the Itza. So it is, it's not just a story about this extraordinary civilization. It's a story about the, the nature of human civilization. And that's what's great about it. I agree. I, I've always thought it's interesting that, you know, as we tell these various stories, uh, and we, we tell stories from all over, you know, all over the world and all, from all over different time periods, that ultimately, uh, no matter where it is, uh, it is all just humans and everything about it is very similar there's there's never been something that you know you read i mean everyone has different cultures but if you read something that's going on in china or like this one in uh the yucatan ultimately they do all sound like people and we can connect to how they how they acted and who the heroes were and how they kind of you know how the power transitioned and how people fought over that and it, it's it's really interesting to to kind of look back at just how human all of that is yeah and, and i you got to wonder I mean, in so many ways, uh, but I mean, uh, you have to wonder that if you were to look back a you know, hundred years or a thousand years, if you look back at civilization today, uh, we're going to see them in the same context. Uh, you know, I imagine yeah. that if you just, you know, pop from, uh, you know, New York City uh, to the Itza, that it would seem like a very strange place. 
But I think if you start to understand yeah. the culture and things like that, you can see uh, how uh, they feel very much the same. And walking around Chichen Itza must have been a lot like walking around New York, the largest, most important metropolitan city in its area. That you know that it, yeah. it's so it's a, it's a great story. It's a fascinating story. Uh, it's an interesting challenge because we're telling history when there's so much of the history we don't know. Uh, but, I mean, you yeah. could also say that as much as we say we don't know the Eats' history, I mean, a huge amount of more modern history has been lost, too. I mean, we find that out even when we try to study oh, stuff yeah. that's fairly recent. And so it's it really is, uh, it, it's it's both very interesting in itself, and it's interesting what it says about the rest of human history. And I think that kind of brings up, you know, the challenges of telling these stories on ancient topics. I actually, I wrote this one, and actually the other one we'll talk about I wrote today, too. But you've done some some episodes on ancient topics, and they really do have some unique challenges. And like you said, one of them is that we we never know exactly how much information we have about them. And even the information we do have, it's usually unclear if uh, how much of it has been mythologized or how much of those stories are strictly accurate. And you could say that about any any period, any ancient culture, because, you know, the Trojan War, I mean, there's been lots of talk over whether that was a historical account or completely fictionalized. And there's still some question as to what pieces of it were fictionalized and what yeah. pieces of did it, it you did can it occur at all or what did it look history. like? Or, yeah, absolutely. So, and so is it any different than the codices that we have, uh, you know, the codices yeah. that we have that have remained and, 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 you know, like I said, you know, we sometimes are doing history that's even relatively recent history and there's still things that we don't yeah. know and that we have to discover. And so it's, you know, I think we can guess that the farther we go forward, even with all of our means of communication and record keeping and et cetera, the farther we go forward, the more that, you know, today will look like, you know, the, the eats will look to us. Yeah. And we might, we might not know just how much of that, you know, I mean, we, we kind of come up with impressions of how, you know, people lived in different times, but I clearly any impression you get from, you know, reading historical books, even if you're talking about, you know, like the, the Gilded Age. Uh, it's hard to get a complete and full understanding of what those those cultures and those times looked like. So even though we have more sources, just because that's the kind of stuff that is difficult to just put into a text and understand. So I mean, I think that that's an interesting thought that you know, no matter what, to some extent, you know, your own your own time period once it's a hundred years in the past it might not ever be fully understood or experienced the way those people experienced it, and that might just be something that's that's. Uh, that's true, that distance from the actual historical events. But with, I mean, to some extent with the ancient topics, we get to find new sources occasionally. Um, I think that's really cool when we do, when we find stuff. I don't know, I honestly don't know if having, you know, if we had all of the codices that were destroyed by the Spaniards, if we had copies of them, all of them, if this story would be more clear or if it would only have gotten more muddled. Yeah, I mean, even it's, it's the... a hard story. I mean, imagine if we had everything that was destroyed and say the dissolution of the monasteries uh, in, in England. Yeah. Would we have a fuller story or would we simply have uh, a story that has more bias in one direction or another? Yeah. So, I mean, it would yeah. be great to have a time machine to be able to go back in time and actually you know, meet and know these people, you know, assuming that they didn't you know, kill you for being a stranger. Uh, but, I mean, we know, yeah. we know more about the Eats <laughs> Uh, than we know about, say, the Mississippian culture, which was a much more recent culture here in North yeah. America, but left behind far less in terms of writing. So uh, it, it, we have what we have, and we can continue to interpret things out of what we have. And occasionally they discover yeah. something else, or they think that they've learned how to read something or see something else. Uh, and that gives us a richer understanding, but it's all you know skewed through time. So it's, it's fun. Yeah. It's the fun of being a historian. If you think that histor history is just the dead past, now history is so very much the living past. And the Itza are a great example of that. Because what what we would have said if you went to Chichen Itza 50 years ago, you would have heard a completely different story than you hear today. And that's that's all because history continues to, to inform us. And that might continue to be true as we look for different sources or as ethnologists try to look at, you know, oral histories that continue to exist, stuff like that. Uh, it's it's amazing how much that it might change. And I think it's amazing to kind of look back. And, and that in itself is a piece of history. But I, I was really glad to tell this story because this is... I mean, this is something people know about the Maya, but this was a specific story we mm -hmm. were able to tell about a group of people who were really interesting. Yeah. And even with just the bits and pieces we've got, we get, we get to really see that this was uh, an amazing culture that thrived for a time. Absolutely, and that, that yeah. was, those were people's whole lives. And it's, I mean, you, you wrote this, this script, if everybody doesn't know, yeah. Josh wrote this script. And one of the things that you did is you compared this story uh, to Gilgamesh. Yeah 
uh, or to uh, uh, Beowulf, and uh, which also yeah. are the Odyssey. I mean, these are the, this is a foundation story, so much like very many others, and that says so much about him. It's so fascinating to hear, and it sounds very much like you know when you talk about ancient Chinese history or when you talk about uh, yeah. history in, in uh, Native American religions, and, and, and if you talk about history in Europe or Africa, uh, then uh, you you they all have these unique stories that make them a unique people, but also show that we really are kind of driven by the same things wherever we go. And so many things came yeah. from and coffee and and co chocolate. <laughs> and, I mean, there's 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 much that came rubber. That there's much that came out of these cultures that was you know discovered that you know we we I think the Spaniards thought that they were so far scientifically ahead of them but it sure sounds like there were some ways that were more developed than the europeans uh, uh hundreds of years before those europeans were up yeah and because you're right in some ways it is interesting to the differences between the cultures and the way their cultures formed and you know what they did have and didn't have but i, I mean they had we we know that they all had some unique uh understandings of things like astronomy uh the 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 Castillo at Chichen Itza is an incredible, it's just an incredible mm -hmm. building. And the way that it was able to do things using the sun and that we can still see that on mm -hmm. solstices and stuff. I mean, that's an incredible, uh, that was an incredible feat of engineering. Think about that, that's a form of writing. But um, we had we had another yeah. episode where we talked about uh, Stonehenge. We talked about the history, even of, of studying the history of Stonehenge, and you know, it really tells us you know that <clears throat> that ancients had a lot of knowledge uh, that wasn't necessarily stored yeah. in a way that makes sense to us to us today, and that we spend our time using our frame of reference to try to understand a frame of reference that's completely different than ours. Uh, and so I you know I don't know. I think everybody that lives in every era thinks that their era is the one that's enlightened. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I think if you... At least we're not like those barbarians. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to wonder, too, if you picked up an, an Itza and you dropped them into New York City today, if they might not uh, think that we're the barbarians. That's fair. And they, I mean, they had some very specific cultural understandings of, of how that worked. And every culture thinks, essentially, that other ones are barbaric in one way or another, that theirs is the civilized yep. one. And it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting discussion. I, I think it's interesting too, you know, even contemporary cultures, uh, the Toltecs were apparently contemporary with uh, Chichen Itza because they came at some point and were involved there. We don't we don't even know if there was, a, you know, if they were if they came as conquerors or if they came as friendly traders. That, yeah, what is, know, yeah, that's... mixed culturally. Yeah, we know less about the Toltecs than we know about the the Itza. Yeah. yeah, and we we know the two were related. Yeah. We know that it was a mixture of their architecture, but we don't really know how they related or how the two came together. It's a story that's you know necessarily lost. So, it's there's it's just a lot of fun in telling ancient history. There's a lot because a lot of it's you know very well forgotten, but there, there's a lot because there's you can you can almost speculate more. Uh, uh, in understanding these societies, and it makes it, you know, it gives you sort of a freedom to yeah. talk about, you know, what uh, that's different than if you're talking about today when you might get lost in the morass of details that we do have uh, to really be able to see yeah. the broader vision. And of course, Chichen Itza is an absolutely amazing place that millions of people want to go see, and and so it's it, yeah. it still attracts that much interest today. So that that tells you how important, you know, the past is, the the ancient yeah. history is. I, uh, I honestly think that, you know, one of the things this story does really well, and I think a lot of ancient stories end up doing, is it leaves a lot of questions too, like the Toltecs, mm -hmm. or, you know, the people on the columns in the Thousand Columns. We, we're not 100% sure who yeah, those are supposed to represent. There's a thousand columns that clearly intended to mean something, and we don't, <laughs> we really don't know what. We don't know what they appear yeah. to represent individual people. Are those kings? Are those warriors? Are those Amazing. gods? Uh, are, you know, who knows? Are they captured people? We all these various ideas that we have, and we we honestly don't know. But they clearly, I mean, man, the amount of work it must have taken to make each one of those columns. They're making, they're hand making them, mm -hmm. and each one is unique. I mean, that's incredible. yeah. Whoever was looking at that had to be able to read that somehow. But I mean, if you think about any particular yeah. graveyard in the United States, you're going to find hundreds and hundreds oh, yeah. of stone markers that represent people that are long forgotten. And this is yeah. And if you don't understand the language or the culture that created that, you know, I mean. We, we, there might be someone looking at those gravestones wondering, man, I wonder why they put what they do yeah, on these, is, you know, why do they mark mean? these? And, and that could be the exact same thing. We, the, I don't know what they meant by those, but it's, it's always interesting to talk about that because I mean, clearly those meant a lot to a lot of people. And for centuries, people must have known what, what they were supposed to mean. And then that's all just been lost. And who knows if they ever wrote it down or if that was something that they expected everyone to understand because that was just something that was ubiquitous in their culture hard to know it, it, well, it's it's hard to, hard to know but i mean that's it's it's great to speculate it's it's great to take make informed guesses yeah. and that's what his, historians yes. are doing whatever we do
Yeah, and people will continue to do that, mm-hmm. and I think it'll be interesting to see how that. We might know a lot more about the Itza, you know, decades from now, or we might essentially be left with the exact same information mm-hmm. that we have today. And I'm I'm really interested to see how that continues to develop that study of history mm-hmm. and that study of those particular histories. Uh, have you have you ever been to? Chichen I have not. No, I, I've, I, I did it vicariously through you. That's all I can say. No, I have, I have many okay. friends that have yeah. been there. I would love to go there. Uh, there's so many sites in the world that you want to see. And I mean, it's. Oh, yeah, right. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It drops that line between history and prehistory. I think we're pretty clear that this is a YouTube yeah. channel, that we're storytellers, and that we don't really care if we're, <laughs> if we're stumbling across that line. Uh, you know, this is. Yeah, we, we, we do stumble across yeah, that I mean, line. Yeah, we're, we're telling we're stories to have, to have fun and people, help people, uh, you know, entertain by history. And so, uh, and, you know, it, the fact that you can produce the record that you did, uh, you know, or, you know that, that we in science can produce the record that we did, suggests that even though this might have been prehistory. Uh, you know, the fact that we've put together that much now says that this is history because history is before, you know, things were written yeah. down and recorded. And now we found the records or we understand the records better. So it also shows that that line is is always moving. But it's it's one of to go back to because I wandered. But to, to go back to I mean, there are many places I would love to see the you know, the great heads on Easter Island, which also leave a lot of questions. Uh, I've been to Stonehenge, but I've not yeah. gotten to see the pyramids. Uh, and wouldn't it be great to be able to go to Axum and, and see the, 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 the megaliths there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Incredible that that stuff and that that one they they just recently moved to it was many many tons they had to get a special plane yeah, just that to fly was, the stuff it there. was taken uh, by the uh, <laughs> Italians uh, and uh, and then it was eventually sent back. Uh, which is another interesting question of history today. I mean, there's there's all sorts of artifacts oh, yeah. all over the world that were taken at some point by conquerors, and and you know we're looking at you know repatriating those, and that's all all interesting too. I I do think you know when I when I was there, me and my wife on our honeymoon, we went down there uh, to Cancun, and so we we went and saw Chichen Itza while we were there. There are lots of Mayan ruins in the Yucatan, and they're they're all special. Mm-hmm. But uh, we we went there. The it was a wonderful trip. I mean, it's just incredible to see what they've they've cleared a lot of the because it was completely overgrown, as you can see in some of the some of the pictures in the YouTube video. It was uh, the the Castillo was almost completely hidden. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they've they've re- renovated that somewhat. When we were there, we didn't we couldn't climb it. Someone had fallen at some yeah, point yeah, down I the stairs. Yeah. They're very steep. One person spoils um, it for everybody else. Yeah, I mean, they're steep. Yeah, 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 that's a, yeah. There's always there's always um, one. Like, can you imagine having hundreds of people going upstairs that steep? You know, and and uh, your mom was there when she could go up there, so she said she's actually been she's up to she's the, been to the top. To the yeah, top. everybody. But the fans yeah. of the history guy are familiar with Betty Joe. She's come onto the podcast here, and she pops on in our locals channel and stuff like that. And yeah, she's been to. Yeah. The, if mom can make it up and down, anybody can make it up and down. It's too too bad they cut up. I, I think there's a lot of new. That's one of the ways that we're learning so much too. Is that I think there's a lot of new techniques that are helping us to find these sites that are kind of lost in the jungle. Yeah. Uh, and that we've got yeah, using yeah, that's, using that's satellite amazing. technology and and uh, drone technology and all sorts of stuff, and that's 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 bringing up some stuff uh, that uh, you, you know could have been found today. And so there's new science every day yeah. that really might give us more insight. Who knows uh, if there isn't some sort of you know holy grail, some sort of stone somewhere uh, that is going to tell us you know the Rosetta Stone of of Central America, and that we're going to find out all sorts of things about yeah. the Toltec and the in the Maya and, and how they all are related. And, yeah. yeah, you know, there's there's more to find. We we seem to be finding that I mean, those cultures were much more dense. Uh, there were m- many more cities and stuff than we had expected, yeah. and that's I mean, that's just amazing stuff. Maybe we'll find uh, even codices that we didn't know existed. Uh, that's that's always the hope with the Mayans is that there's you know some codices. Hidden yeah, in, in knows, some knows place that might. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, uh, I live about 20 miles away from Cahokia Mounds. Um, oh, closer than that, not even 20 miles. Probably as the crow flies, maybe 10 miles from Cahokia Mounds, and we found uh, an extraordinary artifact in our backyard. Uh, and so it's uh, it, that if you have a, a city that large, then you know you would expect that there would be people living out this far. And and the, and the, you know we're yeah. still going to be stumbling on things that tell us about those people. Cahokia is another one that's just an amazing site that we know so little about. That we, <laughs> it was it was uh, funny to so me one to one learn. day I was bebopping around the British Museum and I walk around a corner. And here's a whole room full of stuff from Cahokia Mounds, uh, you know, which is right next to my home. I think they have right more there. artifacts than maybe the museum there at Cahokia Mounds had. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so it, it, there, you know, that yeah, tells that story, too. I mean, it, it's, it fascinates people around the world, the stuff that you're finding in your backyard. Yeah. And whatever backyard you have, there's probably were people there and, and that we don't know as much about the past as we, as we you know, can. And we're going to continue to try to learn. I remember uh, I took an archaeology class. Uh, here in Wyoming, and the the archaeology teacher uh, had worked with the state, and he showed a map of like all the various sites that he had seen, 
uh, that 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 we had found in Wyoming, and they follow they follow the interstates. You can just you can literally see all these sites following the roads. And he said that's that's not because that's where these people were concentrated. That's because that archaeological work was done because they had to before you put the interstate in. You've got to do this archaeological work to make sure you're not destroying uh, cultural artifacts and stuff like that. And he oh, he pointed out just imagine you know if you look at the density of those sites and spread them across the whole state it's like that's what it's that's what it's really like anywhere you look there's probably some evidence of people having been there for the hundreds or thousands of years that they were and we just don't see them because you know we've built stuff over it or we didn't we didn't know what to look for and stuff like that i think that's an amazing it's amazing to remember that these spaces that we are so familiar with were familiar to people hundreds of years ago in very different ways Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? You know, I watched a really interesting video that was about uh, finding the tomb of uh, Genghis Khan. And I, honestly, there's a lot in there I didn't know. But uh, when Genghis Khan died, uh, it was at a period in Mongolian culture uh, where the royalty did not make a big deal of their tombs. Uh, and in fact, there's a, a, a belief that if the body was uncovered, that he would go back to being immortal, essentially. And so they put a lot of effort into hiding Genghis Khan's tomb, even though he's, you know, this incredibly, he's, he's the founder of the Mongolian nation, but he's also one of the most important personages in history. And we don't know where he's buried. Uh, and so this is interesting because it's people that have been spent their lives uh, searching and they're getting for the first time to be able to search in some fairly sacred areas in Mongolia uh, and trying to find the, t I won't spoil the end, uh, but I will say that it is a fascinating piece of history. It is fascinating both in the, in the detective work that's done looking for it. Uh, it's also fascinating in what you learn about the culture and Genghis Khan in watching it. It was absolutely delightful, very much tied to the, the topic of the episode today in terms of you know, ancient cultures that we only know something about. And uh, it was, uh, it was, you never know what you're going to find on Magellan TV, but it's always going to be something absolutely fascinating to watch. One of the things I love about Magellan TV and just the number of uh, documentaries they're able to get you, the different passions of all these various people who are explored in these documentaries and these people who have, you know, dedicated their lives to finding these various things. Mm -hmm. And it's always just very clear anything, anything on Magellan TV, the people who made it are clearly passionate and the people who are behind Magellan TV who are making sure that they curate this content are very passionate about it as well. One of the things I watched recently was called When Will Time End? As with so many things that we've talked about on the channel in terms of Magellan, uh, it's very different from uh, what the history guy was watching this this week. This one really talks about what we think might happen to the universe in untold billions of years. But it, it started with kind of talking about how the how the universe began. It was incredibly condensed to understand all this because of course cosmology and all that's just huge there's so much information and then it talks about what we think is going to be happening in the future and some of the ideas of whether we're expanding into you know an actual space and it kind of talks about some really interesting stuff and in, like in terms of what we think might happen to black holes Stephen Hawking had a theory that uh black holes are going to shed mass and so you know this idea that there's there's a constant entropy in the universe. I mean, he suggested that that applied even to black holes. Uh, it's called When Will Time End? And it's really worth a watch if you want to kind of get a, an idea about that really big picture cosmology stuff. It's, it's one of the great things about Magellan TV. That was one of the ones that I considered watching <laughs> when I instead watched the other one on Genghis Khan. One of the great things about Magellan TV is that there's just such a breadth of stuff that you yeah. can watch. And so whatever you're in the mood for, I mean, I was flipping through true crime, but I was also flipping through natural history, but there's a lot of just great straight up history on there, but there's also a lot of great space and science. And uh, you, you, if you like to learn, if you want to learn something new every day, there's no better place really than Magellan TV. And that's why we love Magellan TV. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Next, The History Guy tells the story of the forgotten empire of Axum. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the history guy.
In the long annals of human history, many empires have left an indelible mark both in the popular memory and the historical record. Empires like the Roman Empire, the Mongol Empire, the Chinese dynasties, or the Persian Empire. But for every empire whose name you recognized, many other great empires rose and fell and largely faded from popular memory. And yet, in their relative obscurity are still important links in the history of humankind. And one such empire was the Kingdom of Aksum, otherwise known as the Empire of Ethiopia, which flourished at the same time as Rome and Byzantium and became an important center of trade between those empires and empires in India, Sri Lanka, and the Far East, and also played an interesting role in the three major monotheistic religions of the Middle East. The Kingdom of Aksum deserves to be remembered. The kingdom of Aksum flourished in the 1st century AD to about the 7th century. Its center was the city of Aksum, located in the highlands of northern Ethiopia. The kingdom had its roots in the so-called Proto-Aksumite period, beginning about the 4th century BC, and became a force to be reckoned with by the 1st century AD. By that time, it was widely known as an excellent market for ivory, tortoise shells, and rhino horns, as recorded in the Greco-Roman Periplus of the Erythrian Sea, a kind of traveler's handbook that covered trading opportunities in the Red Sea and beyond, as far as southwestern India. The kingdom's earliest years are the subject of some scholarly debate, but it is known that the kingdom's written language, Gez, is a member of the Semitic family of languages, mostly centered in the Middle East. Other Semitic languages include Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, and Akkadian. Gez is no longer a spoken language, but it is used widely as the liturgical or holy language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church, as well as other Ethiopian and Eritrean churches. The language may have been brought over by southern Arabic people in the 8th century, but some linguistic evidence suggests Semitic languages were spoken in the Horn of Africa for millennia. The value of this early script is significant. The biblical book of Enoch survives as a complete text only in Gez, and Ethiopian translations of the Bible are among the oldest surviving in the world. In its early years, the growing wealth from trade at its port city of Adulis allowed the kingdom to expand its influence over a large part of modern Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen. The kingdom owes its growth to a shift in global trade patterns. Overland routes to India and other routes became less popular when traders learned that they could take advantage of monsoon winds to cross the Arabian Sea to India. The volume of trade that came through the Red Sea ballooned and brought enormous wealth and prosperity to traders along the route. Aksum would become the principal supplier of African goods to Rome. The kingdom subjugated a number of tribes in modern-day Somalia and extended some kind of dominance across the Red Sea over Himyar in modern-day Yemen. Conquered tribes were allowed some autonomy, but were required to pay tribute to Aksum, often in the form of heads of cattle, according to Aksumite inscriptions. As the kingdom became an empire, the Aksumite kings took on the title of Nagusa Nagast, or King of Kings. Whether this reflected a system of sub-kings is not yet clear. By the mid-4th century, Aksum was at its height. It was in that century that the kingdom began using the name Ethiopia, according to inscriptions. It was also in that century that Aksum played a role in the decline of the once powerful kingdom of Kush. Kush was a Nubian kingdom that had, for a time, installed pharaohs that ruled over a combined Egyptian Kushite kingdom. By the 4th century, Kush was a shadow of its former self, and a dispute led the Aksumite king, Izana, to attack and possibly sack the capital of Mero. The kingdom of Aksum is possibly most famous for its enormous stele, large decorated obelisk-like columns that had been built in the region for centuries. Hundreds of the monuments surround the city of Aksum today in steely fields, many of them marking the sites of underground burial chambers. The three largest of these, called the Royal Stele, are the 79-foot-tall Azana Stele, the fallen 108-foot-tall Great Stele, and the so-called Obelisk of Aksum. The Aksumites left a monument at Meroe and built another at Aksum to document Azana's victories, including that over the Kushites. The stone had writing on it in Gez, Sabian, and Greek thus representing a Rosetta Stone for these languages. King Azana ruled from the 320s to 356. Azana was the first Aksumite king to embrace Christianity, being converted sometime between 325 and 328. He advocated for Christianity in his own kingdom, less than two decades after the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great converted. The conversion of Ethiopia was, according to tradition, the responsibility of a single man. From Mencius of Tyre, According to the Roman historian Terenius Rufinius, as children, Frumentius and his brother went with their uncle on a ship to the Red Sea, where the crew was attacked and killed 
by pirates, because don't all good stories involve pirates? And the boys taken captive. They were given to the king of Aksum, Mazana's father, as slaves, but gained favor with the king before his death, and were freed. Izana's mother begged them that they stay, as Izana was too young to rule, and she needed help teaching him and managing the kingdom. When Izana took the throne, Frumentius was an important advisor to the kingdom. Frumentius traveled to Alexandria to talk to the bishop there, who consecrated him bishop and promised to assist him in Aksum's conversion. On his return, he baptized the king, and shortly after founded the original Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Aksum, a rebuilt version of which still stands today. This became the site where Ethiopian emperors and later emperors of Abyssinia were crowned. The Ethiopian church enjoyed significant autonomy, but did follow the church in Alexandria to split from the Roman church following disagreements after the Council of Chalcedon in 451. The kingdom began minting its own currency during the reign of the king Indubis at the end of the 3rd century, and continued minting coins for 400 years. They were one of the only ancient states in sub-Saharan Africa to mint their own currency, and one of only four in the world who were minting gold coins at the time. Izana began minting coins bearing the Christian cross, one of the earliest examples of the symbol on coins. The relative abundance of Aksumite coins indicates that the kingdom had access to large supplies of gold, although it is uncertain what the kingdom's sources were. Aksumite coins are also notably pure, and the supply of metals was closely controlled by the Aksumite state. The kingdom's trade influence was great. Aksumite coins have been found as far afield as India and Sri Lanka. The next major expansion was under King Caleb in the 6th century. Caleb was recognized as a Christian by the Byzantine Emperor Justin I, who sought Caleb's assistance in ending atrocities committed by the Himerite king against Christians in modern-day Yemen. Caleb defeated and killed the Himerite king, and the kingdom remained a tributary under the Aksumite general Abraha and his son Masruk. Masruk's brother revolted with the help of the Sassanid Persian Empire, leading to a series of wars that were eventually won by the Persians. Munro Hay, a modern historian, cites these wars as one of the factors in the kingdom's collapse, thanks to the war's cost and loss of prestige. The kingdom's decline was caused by many factors. In addition to strength loss fighting the Persians, the kingdom may also have been affected by the Plague of Justinian, probably the first appearance of bubonic plague, which killed millions in other parts of the world. In the early 7th century, the growing dominance of the Islamic Empire in the region isolated the country from other Christian states and largely ended their trading empire. But unlike Christian Europe, Aksum was not on bad terms with its Islamic neighbors. Muhammad began preaching publicly in 610, but the ruling tribe of Mecca persecuted his followers. In the middle 610s, Muhammad advised his adherents, including his daughter, to seek refuge in Aksum, in an episode known as the First Hijra. The king of Aksum is said to have refused a Meccan delegation, which sought their return. There are different accounts of the effects of the exile, with some Islamic accounts suggesting that local Aksumites embraced Islam, while some Ethiopian accounts instead suggest that some of the exiles converted to Christianity. Other ancient Christian kingdoms, such as Nobatia, Mercuria, and Elodia, to the northeast, would eventually become Islamic, but Aksum and its successors remained Christian. Despite their relationship with Islam, as early as 640, attacks were made at the port of Adulis, and the kingdom was forced to abandon the city of Aksum and retreat inland. This marked the end of the kingdom's trading empire. However, the kingdom remained formidable and continued to expand south for several centuries. According to Ethiopian tradition, the kingdom was conquered by a Jewish queen named Judith in the 10th century, but contemporary scholars doubt whether she was really Jewish. Still, there is evidence of burned churches and rule by a female usurper in contemporary documents. Another factor in the kingdom's decline might have been climatological. With the collapse of the trading empire, there was over-farming on the terraced hillsides, which led to an erosion crisis that cascaded into a food shortage. And the, the favorable rainy season seems to become less reliable in the 9th and 10th centuries. The kingdom collapsed completely by 960, replaced by the kingdom ruled by the local Agawa people called the Zagwe dynasty, which lasted until 1270. It was overthrown by Yakuno Amlak, who claimed to be descended from a survivor of Judah's purge. Additionally, during this new Ethiopian empire, the Kebra Nagast, or Glory of Kings, was compiled and written, and considered to be a reliable historical work by the Ethiopian church. The work is a national epic describing the fandom of Aksum, containing the genealogy of the kings of Aksum, and the story of how the Ethiopians stopped worshipping the sun and moon to worship the Lord God of Israel. The bulk of the work tells the story of the biblical Queen of Sheba, whom it identifies as Makeda of Ethiopia. As told in the Bible, she visits King Solomon in Israel and is impressed by the wealth and knowledge there. 
but it then breaks from the biblical narrative by stating that she and Solomon conceived a child. The son, Menelik, visited his father as an adult, but refused to remain in Israel, so Solomon sent the firstborn children of the nation's elders with him to Ethiopia. Upset with their lot, these sons stole the Ark of the Covenant, and thanks to divine intervention, escaped Solomon's agents. It weaves together a narrative that the kings of Aksum and later Ethiopia were a single line descended from Solomon as far back as 900 BC, and the Ethiopian church still claims the Ark is in their possession at the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. Modern scholarship on the work is lacking, but there is a possibly ancient Jewish population in Ethiopia known as the Beta Israel. Their origin remains uncertain, and even oral tradition suggests several possibilities. Many of them have in the modern era immigrated to Israel. In the 1930s, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia led to Italian soldiers taking one of the three royal stele, the one called the Obelisk of Axum, in five pieces to Rome as a trophy, where it was erected under the orders of Benito Mussolini. It was kept there until its repatriation finally began in 2003. The pieces were so large that only the Anatov-124, a Russian plane, could carry it, among other difficulties. It has been reconstructed and now stands in its original home at Axum. The Solomonic dynasty was removed from power in 1974, and today the once great kingdom of Aksum and its ruins are spread throughout several modern states. Its name is barely remembered, its modern influence is obscure. But in its time it was mighty. The Persian philosopher Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, described it as one of the four great powers of his time, with the others being Rome, Persia, and China. And of course, of that list, the kingdom of Axum is the one that is far least remembered today. But it, the important role that it played in the development of some of the world's great religions and its once powerful trading empire give it a unique role in history that deserves to be remembered. But there's still so much we don't know, many questions still unanswered. And the, the, the forgotten history of the kingdom of Axum reminds us of the enduring complexity of world politics and how much history there still is out there yet to be uncovered. Though it's almost been forgotten, the Empire of Axum actually has a lot in common with other empires. And it's, it's interesting because they were, they were a seafaring culture. Clearly, they were a coastal country that, that was based on their ports. Uh, and, you know, they, those, there are things that you learn about people like them. But that's very like the Greeks. It's very like the Phoenicians. And, uh, and, 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 you know, very much Egypt also was also built on its ports. And that, tr that international trade made them wealthy, but also is what eventually made them vulnerable. I mean, that's, that's again, another one of those stories that's it's not exactly unique to Axum. Uh, it, it tells you that there's, uh, you know, that things grow in the kind of the same way wherever you are because people are still people. This one is interesting, too, because, you know, the, the, the Itza were very unknown. And I think that a lot of people wouldn't have even recognized that the Itza were a, that that indicated a specific group of people. But Axum is arguably even less known because I think that people people do at least know about Chichen Itza. I think it's reasonably well known. Whereas Axum, uh, even I hadn't heard anything about it until pretty pretty briefly before I started writing the script on it. And I think it's an interesting, just an incredible kingdom, another empire that existed that we forgot about because it faded. And I wonder how many more yep. are like that, how many more there are like that that we know even less about. Absolutely. Well, and certainly, you know, because we are, you know, you have to say you're Western-centric oh, yeah. wherever you are. I mean, we probably are more likely to have heard of Chichen Itza here in America than we are of Axum. Uh, but, I mean, point. if you're from Ethiopia, I mean, you're, yeah, those those big pillars yeah, are yeah, standing around. Might, I mean, people remember. see that as part of their heritage and their history, or Eritrea. Uh, and so uh, it is, I mean, so, I mean, when we say that it's forgotten, maybe that part of that is, you know, as, as a Western-centric thing. But I, I think that there's far many, many more places where we know that there are ruins and we know almost nothing about who made those ruins. And... Uh, I mean, it, Axum is a good example, uh, and I think many Americans will be surprised to hear about it. I think maybe many people in Southern Europe or Africa might not be so surprised to have heard of Axum. But I mean, it is, if anything, it's even less known than the Itza, uh, and it gives you all the same sorts of questions and all the same sorts of answers that you would get there, and that is that these were people, and these were amazing yeah. people who knew a lot and did a lot, uh, and I think would astound us, thinking we're all special today. I mean, they probably didn't have airplanes. They probably didn't have nuclear power plants, uh, but they uh, probably lived uh, a comfortable life and probably at the time saw themselves as enlightened and advanced. I think much and, more and cosmopolitan very much the way we like to think about us than we might expect of them, uh, especially as a trading yeah. culture. And they find their coins as far away as, you know, Sri Lanka 
in, in India, and it's it's yeah, incredible yeah. to imagine that this was centerpiece of trade, yeah. and they and they made use of that. But also, I mean, what they did with agriculture, yeah. terraced agriculture, and you know, having you know, making the desert blue. Yeah. I mean, that's that's something we struggle with today, and that, that they were able to do at least for at least for a brief time. And it seems like maybe there was some stuff they. Uh, they they talk about that maybe the climatological effects of over farming and stuff might have been part of why they declined. But I mean, also just yeah, well, those are lessons that we're still yeah. learning today too. You know, not easy lessons. To, to some learn. extent, I mean, all empires decline, <laughs> and it's it's hard to talk about that in terms yes. of the modern world. I'm not making any comments on you know the power of modern states or anything like that. But uh, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, various Chinese empires, no matter where you were, uh, they, they all decline eventually. And they, they go up, they, they go do. down. Yeah, you have to wonder if if it was always yeah. obvious. I mean, you have to wonder if, you know, if you were in the middle of the stuff that we look back on and say that was the decline of the empire at the time, they're like, oh, this place is falling apart. Yeah. Uh, or if they, you know, if they realized it or not. And there's certainly people today saying this place is falling apart. This empire is in decline. And there's, you know, others today I think that we're on the rise. And the only, the only way you're going to know it is going to be when you look in the far future. And then we'll think back, it's obvious. And then we're going to have that same skewed perspective that we have yeah. about ancient cultures that we only know so much about. So it's, it's, it's fun to study. One of the, the fundamental lessons of history is we've been here before. That's one of the things I always love to find is you find out that as you go through history, what you find is people are people and people have faced every obstacle that we face today. They have faced in different ways in the past. And yet, you know, still here we are. Uh, it's one of the great stories. But it, it also it teaches you some uh, some humility in the face of hubris because uh, we think we're so special. Then we realize that you know, we're not the first ones to think that. And uh, those others are ruins. Yeah. Now. And some of them, some of them faced incredible, incredible obstacles and overcame them. Other ones faced obstacles that uh, might seem simple to us now and seem to have obvious solutions. And they didn't come up with those solutions at the time. It's, it is, and I wonder, you know, with with Axum, the transition from being the ancient empire of Axum to being the the Abyssinia, the Ethiopian empire that existed for centuries afterward. I, I mean, I wonder what they, how people living through that really saw, and saw that transition. I wonder that with you know the fall of Rome into uh, the chaotic period of uh, many states and warring states and stuff that like that that we had during those early Middle Ages. And I, I wonder what people, how people experience that, because I think that's something that's hard to. Uh, it's it's hard to see when we when we just have you know the physical sources that yeah. we have. Yeah, I, when the Huns come and burn the city and burn Rome, yeah. right? I mean, or, or the, the Huns or the or the, <laughs> the Romans or probably whoever. felt it. They... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then they they probably had an idea. Oh, something's different here. You know, <laughs> they, they didn't used to do that. But Rome got sacked many times and then they came back. I mean, but uh, I mean, there might have been very obvious instances where you saw your civilization yeah. falling. Uh, that that might have been the story with Troy, and might, might, that might be what the story of the Trojan War is. If, if Troy even existed as a, as a historical place, which you don't really know for sure, but maybe it was. It was yeah. a catastrophic war, and that was that. But uh, but for, for many of them, that decline, I mean, for the Roman Empire, the decline took centuries and centuries. As a matter of fact, there's still vestiges of the, you know, the yeah. culture of Rome that are still around. It, it degraded for centuries and centuries. So maybe what, there was that day, you know, one day they had a Roman emperor and finally he was the last Roman emperor. And, and you know, they came and got rid of the last Roman emperor. And you're like, oh, well, that's finally that's it. Uh, you know, and you wonder if the senators yeah. in that day were like, you know, wondering what it was like to have been a senator 200 years before. But I mean, over a very long yeah. period, did the people of Rome know that the, that the country had peaked? I, I don't know. Did yeah. they know it was in decline? I, I don't know. Uh, and uh, it, we have people of different opinions on that today. Yeah, well, that's that's true about when when we think the the, the peak of various uh, even even our modern states about whether we think they've peaked or we're going to peak. And and the truth is, you just you just don't know. And of course, I mean, history travels uh, uniquely no matter where it is. And mm -hmm. so you can learn lessons from the past, but that doesn't necessarily, I mean, if we could tell the future by just reading the past, we, we'd all be millionaires, <laughs> but <laughs> we're, true. We're, we're not. So, <laughs> But what you can we say, can, though, is can... if you read the past, when the present turns, you know, when the present and the future turn into the past, you can say, oh, that's not surprising the way that turned out if you understood the past. True. But in the end, it doesn't, it doesn't help you actually predict the future. <laughs> and that's, except yeah. that I think the prediction of the future that I've come to have in my study of history is that I think that we'll make it. I think, I you think know, that someday that there will still be people around, and they might be researching yeah. us as as an ancient, forgotten civilization. Uh, but I think that uh, we'll overcome whatever we run into. And you know, well, and I think you know we exactly how that happens. I mean, there have been some true 
catastrophes, the fall of Rome and how, and I mean, there was, there was a point, you know, in those middle ages, I think we don't really call them the dark ages anymore, uh, but there was, there was a contraction cities, cities ceased to exist mm -hmm. for almost, you know, for like 800 years. And so you, you wonder, even though that must have seemed to some people, uh, like a dramatic decline and when we look back now you know you can see it as a dramatic decline i mean ultimately there was never a point in there where humanity faced extinction yeah there were going to be people and yeah. it was just a it was a change in the face of natural disaster in the face of human disaster in the face of disease or war or famine uh, there was never a risk that humanity wouldn't survive of course you know they didn't have yeah. nuclear bombs either but uh, i i think uh, i think that that it's still true that it would, I mean, we we have people, people live permanently right now on the South Pole. Uh, there's people living yeah. permanently, we've had people permanently occupying the space station, despite all the, the, the technological consequences, and you know, now that geopolitical consequences, but we've had people living in the space station since the early 2000s. Uh, so, I mean, the, the fact is humans are ridiculously adaptable, and I think that we will survive. I think we'll survive whatever comes. I mean, that's that's the lesson that I get. Yeah, you can disagree. I'm not trying to you know, fight with anybody, and I, I'm, I'm a historian. I don't know the future. Uh, I just say that the past gives me comfort. Uh, that there will be a future. That's that's generally the feeling that I have. And that doesn't preclude disaster, but yeah, I mean, uh, there were certainly times something when something fell. And uh, look at the uh, oh, look yeah. at the, the the Polish Empire, the Polish Lithuanian Empire. I mean, at one point it was the largest uh, in Europe, uh, and at one point, then you know, four other powers worked to try to entirely destroy the history to erase it from history. Yeah, uh, but they're still Poland today. But uh, I mean, it's 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 interesting to say you can have a large, mighty empire. Uh, and then at some point you don't know where Genghis Khan's buried. I mean that's that's just yeah. kind of how it works. Uh, so I we, are, we, are we, you know, how far are we either. in the in the Axum it's a timeline? You know, how how long before we're 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 strolling up? You know, the steps of the Capitol building. You know, the way that we stroll to the top of the. Uh, of the Castillo, I you know I, I I don't know I don't know where we are in that in that in that part. Question. And the thing is, it's very hard to go back and say you know if if we were living in Chichen Itza. Uh, if we were living in Axum, you know, would we see it? I, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, all I can say is you can make the best of the life that you have today. I do think, I mean, it makes sense, I think, where Axum's position is as we kind of get back to that. Um, it makes sense that it would be a trading power. Mm -hmm. I think that people, when we think of trade from east to west and west to east in that period, it gets kind of... Uh, overlooked because of the Silk Road, which I think is the one that gets most of the conversation. But it does make sense that by sea, uh, you yeah. know, even if you just follow the shore, you can, you can get to India that way. And yeah. the, the isthmus was always understood to be fairly, I mean, you Tra know, There's so thin. many things that you can move more easily by sea than you can move on land. Yeah. Uh, and almost everything moves faster by sea than on land. So it's not surprising. Uh, they were essentially the Suez Canal, right? I mean, they were, they were that connection yeah. between the two. So yeah, it does make sense. It's perfectly located, and that's why it rose the way that it rose, and that's why you know maybe they had coins when other people, other cultures in Africa didn't have coins, uh, and uh, and that's why they became a powerful empire. And eventually, I think that's why they fell is because their position yeah. was in such a good spot that people coveted it and you know wanted to take it away. And it was shockingly uh, fragile. Uh, the, you know, it relied on the what it wasn't a huge section of coast that they controlled mm -hmm. and you know once you lose you lose your port it's very hard to get it back yep. <laughs> and that's and i mean the the empire you know vestiges of it continued to exist in the highlands and they did incredible things i mean the the stele that they have up there are really really quite incredible and i think things that one of the one of the reasons i wanted to tell this story is because those were those are things that are really truly cool that i don't think people know a lot about that these were things that people that these people did and that just like you know the the great stone structures like stonehenge or in the in mexico uh, that there were great stone structures there too and there are lots of other great stone structures in sub-saharan and deep africa yeah, absolutely i mean people know there's great stone structures in africa because everybody knows what the pyramids Certainly are the, the pyramids, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah the sphinx and the pyramids <laughs> but uh, you know who knows how, how far south they went and and how yeah. but i mean how many people know i again i live not too far from a mountain that's the size of a pyramid you know it was built by hand 
Uh, and so uh, everywhere, yeah. you know, people were accomplishing things, we don't always, you know, necessarily notice what's right outside the back door. But yeah, it is, it was clearly just an extraordinary culture. I mean, we were talking about there was a, 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 one of these obelisks was taken by the uh, the Italians uh, after the Ethiopian yeah. War. The, the, and uh, and it was in Rome for a very long time, and the decision was to return it. And I mean, they the, the largest airplane that we have today was required in order to try to return this pieces. But somehow... Without cranes, you know that was erected yeah. and built, uh, and that's yeah. that's a people that really you know know how to do things and, and knew how to do things in ways that we probably don't know how to do things. So it would have been lovely to see Axum in its prime and to see exactly what that meant yeah. and how the people lived. And and uh, I mean, uh, you know, that would be a fascinating understanding of of, of people. And but there 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 were many peoples that would be great to see where they are. There was a great Malian empire. You know, at one point the the king yeah. of Malia was so wealthy that he devalued the value of gold throughout Africa because he could throw so much of it off the back of his camel on the way on the hot. Yeah, that was, that was a, yeah. another story you told, and it's, it's just an amazing one, something that, uh, and I think that there, it's important to remember, you know, that, that every, almost every location on earth has some incredible colorful history to yeah. it. Wherever there were people, that's, there was colorful history. Yeah, there was colorful history, yep. That, well, something we talked about a little bit in this is Axum's connection with religious history is really interesting. Like, uh, like say Armenia, where we've kind of got these these Christian strongholds that existed, even though they were surrounded by other cultures, and uh, I mean, just Axum was surrounded by Muslim cultures. Mm -hmm. It's it becomes its own Christian enclave, and that, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, well, and, and and Jewish history too. But I mean, they maintained yeah. this religion, you know, when others around them were converted or overcome, uh, and it because it was separated, it kind of formed its own flavor and own type. Uh, and that's it shows the persistence of culture, uh, even in the face of, of conquest or decline. You know, people hung on to beliefs in a way in the same way that the Itza were living on an island when the uh, when the the, 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 yeah. the conquistadors got there. And but they said we came from Chichen Itza, even though it had been abandoned for hundreds of years. I mean, they you know, they, they continue to keep the history. That's I mean, that's how how people work. Again, you know, that similarity between the two tells you that this says a lot about humanity. But it is it tells us so much about the history of Judaism and Christianity that you have this older version that was maintained, yeah. even as it was modified and changed in what we thought of the center of Christianity and the centers of Judaism. Yeah. It, it really is interesting. And they've got connections to this, uh, this supposed Jewish queen, Judith. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's amazing that they have a story about how, you know, they went to uh, Solomon and that they're, they're, they still descend from Solomon, their kings do, mm -hmm. and that they stole the Ark of the Covenant <laughs> and still have it. Um, I have, you know, I have no idea. If the <laughs> Church of Ethiopia has the Ark of the Covenant, but I think it is a really it's it is was unexpected when I read that. It's a really interesting uh, piece of a mythos or as whatever people, it as is. people search for the Ark of the Covenant, there are priests yeah. who insist that they are responsible for maintaining the Ark of the Covenant, yeah. and they take it out every year and march it down the streets, but covered. Yeah. Uh, and so that you, yeah, and, and uh, they don't, you know, they're not going to let anybody look at it because it's, it's an important religious relic. It's it's interesting how those pieces fit together. It's interesting how we have developed our own mythology around that. It's interesting that probably the most that most people in America know about the Ark of the Covenant think that it's in a in a warehouse after Indiana Jones recovered it. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it it's it, again that shows how they were that kind of that connection between East and West yeah. and how they maintained uh, even some of these faiths even as they modified and were and destroyed throughout other places yeah. on the earth. It's all a very interesting story. I have no idea if the Ark of the Covenant was actually a thing, and if it is, if that's the one. Uh, but it certainly is. Uh, it's it's fantastic to me that, that that they share the story, and that there's this yeah. you know this argument over who might have it because it just shows how how interconnected really the societies were at the time. And so it's you know it's yeah. an intriguing idea. Is that is that truly the relic? That's talked about in the Old Testament yeah. that was, you know, carried before the armies of Israel uh, and it's now in Ethiopia. I mean, that, that's just it's fantastic that we even consider the idea. And uh, it's yeah, because it, I mean, it would, be, it would be an amazing story if that's if it if absolutely it is. It would be. An amazing and I don't story. know. Yeah. I, I have no I, I that's something that probably will never be confirmed or denied but it's it's really it's really amazing and i think it's cool that you know they've got some of the oldest translations of the bible mm -hmm. i think that's something that would surprise a lot of a lot of people especially in the west that some of the oldest translations of the bible are in uh, gez 
<laughs> which is this this Ethiopian language that is, uh, I mean, it looks it's it's really a unique language. The 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 writing and the script on it's really really quite interesting. But I don't think that I mean that's a language most people probably haven't even yeah, heard of. Never and heard of it's yeah. I think you venture to say the vast majority of Americans have never heard of Axum at all and have no idea yeah. that there were Ethiopian Christians that were left behind or that had that tradition, uh, and you know that you can you can you can school for for a dozen years and barely scratch the surface of your own culture's history. Uh, yeah. How do you come to understand the history of all these other cultures? I mean, there's just so much. But that's one of the reasons and, it's fun to be the history guys. We get to go tell these stories. Yeah, We get to tell all these stories. You know, the, these ancient stories, we, we often will mention uh, what kind of sources we have. Mm -hmm. And even I try to mention if there's been specific and like serious accusations of bias in the various sources, the sources frequently disagree. Yeah. Well, I mean, almost any ancient source is going to have a lot of bias built into it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you have to just accept that. Maybe, I mean, we're going to give uh, you know, the goal in the history, guys, not for us to bring in our bias. The goal is for us to try to give it as, as neutrally as we can. But there's going to be bias in their sources. It's going to be bias in our reading of the sources. And we can't guarantee that everything we say is exactly as it is. We can just say, this is the best we can do. And that makes for a good story that tells us a lot. And that story might change as we, as we learn more. It is incredible that a power like Axum, which at one point could be considered one of the greatest powers of an age, can fade so completely. Yeah. And I feel like it's a, it's it reminds me of the 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 Shelley the Shelley poem Ozymandias. You know, look, <laughs> a, look upon my work, see mighty, mighty and despair. And despair. <laughs> Round as is that it, boundless <laughs> and bare, the lone and level sand stretches far, far away. Yeah. It's it's it really is amazing because you wonder how. How do peoples like this exist and be so have such incredible lives and empires and uh, you know trading fleets and then we we forget so much of it and I think that whoever I mean, honestly, whoever built accents, that obelisk or had that obelisk built for them yeah. they said this way no one will ever forget me you know yeah. and and they, and it's interesting because you know you go to Washington D.C. we got a really big obelisk there thinking that no one's ever yeah, going to forget point, it. And, and you have to wonder someday, are, you know, are people going to have no idea what that obelisk is all about? Yeah, after the after the apes take over or something like that, <laughs> are we going <laughs> to, are they going to be like, yeah, we don't really know why they built this. We think they, we, uh, we think they liked things that were really tall. <laughs> so I, it's, uh, it is amazing how many Ozyman dioceses are in history yeah. uh, who, who built this to say, you will never forget me. And now we're, we wonder who they were. It's, it's just and amazing. I wonder, uh, I wonder how many more might have existed that we know even less about. Absolutely, uh, yeah. there was. There's. We have all these stories about various kings and emperors and pharaohs or whoever they were who pe other other people tried to erase or yeah. tried to you know uh, had tried to wipe out all the sources or talk badly about them like ah oh, this guy was an evil 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 king and that, that's yeah. that's and the then, source. That them there's somebody, that that's all we have is that the person that didn't like him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a really a great interesting question. for all the history that we have and all the history there is to tell. And I, we will never run out of stories in the history guy. I won't live long enough, uh, but uh, no. you couldn't possibly. But uh, for all the stories that we have, you know, there are uh, thousands more that were lost. And that's uh, it's a tragedy of history, but it's a reason to try to preserve what you have. If you have if you have a, a photo album upstairs of your family, that's the last of that record. Uh, and if it's up to you to learn that history and to keep that history alive, or you know, you'll that'll be the obelisk and axum, the, the the story that meant something that's just lost, and and some of that will never be rediscovered. So that the the bits and pieces that we have from history tells us what we've lost from history, and it also tells us how important it is to preserve the history that we have today. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.